Hello and welcome to a special mashup of the In the Money Players podcast and Baby Talk, the season premiere of Baby Talk Even. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital, back with you in the Brooklyn Bunker once again, joined by the regular co-host when it comes to all things Baby Talk. Had a lot of fun conversations with this man last year, mostly about the two-year-olds. You can think of this as the Where Are They Now show about the two-year-old class of 2021. And we bring him in now from Gainesway Farm, today's sponsor, Sean Tugel. Tugel, what's up? Oh, enjoying, uh, we're in the full-fledged f- flight here of uh, breeding season. Keeneland's well underway. We had you in town last week, and that was always good to have you in town. And and um, so it was great racing here over the last two weeks, and uh, couldn't be happier with uh, the first foals from both our uh, Stallion Spun to Run and, and McKenzie that are dropping this year. And uh, so Raging Bull, first year horse, we can catch up. We haven't talked about him since uh, we left Baby Talk off last last year. So a lot of things good are happening. And and certainly the fact that we're even talking about Derby and it's right around the corner makes uh, makes me even more excited. I am very interested in the Raging Bull acquisition. A horse who was on the radar from very early on, not just because uh, of my love for the Scorsese film that that shares his name, but a particularly good-looking horse, very obviously from early in the career. And uh, he's off to a promising start out there. Very curious to hear about the good old Raging Bull. He's doing great. Um, his, his name fits him in the shed, I can tell you that much. We'll leave it at that, G-rated. But uh, he loves his job. He's got a great book of first mares. He's going to breed well over 100 mares, which is a uh, great support for a first-year horse. Certainly, he's the only son of superstar sire Dark Angel here in America. So that's uh, a great benefit to American breeders. And, uh, you know, you add in that pedigree and you add in the looks and uh, you get off to a good start here with with a first-year horse. So we're very excited to see his foals come next year. It is amazing, the proliferation of turf racing at the highest levels and creation of new races worth a lot of money. I mean, I would think it's this isn't a case of, of a horse who's going to have to 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 prove himself. He's going to be in demand, I would think, right from the right from the get go when it comes to how racing is evolving here in the States and, and something that not a lot of horse players are always going to think about. But I think it actually help you when you're analyzing a race. It just makes sense to reach for a new bloodline, one that's been proven so successful on the turf uh, around the globe. Absolutely. Um, that, that was a major appeal to him for us, uh, as well as his speed figures and his soundness and his race record. Um, certainly, Dark Angel is a great source of two-year-old uh, precocity as well as speed. Um, so you add that into the mix, and, and he also gets plenty of dirt winners at the high levels uh, in Dubai and other areas where, where dirt's available outside just Europe. So um, that gives us a lot of excitement for him come a uh, couple of years down the road when uh, hopefully we're talking about him being a leading freshman sire. So we position this as the where are they now of the two-year-old class. A lot of the two-year-olds we spent a lot of time talking about last year, not necessarily uh, making an impact on this year's Kentucky Derby, but we did follow the season all the way through to those big aqueduct dirt races uh, for two-year-olds towards the end of the year historically maybe the remsen not uh the most productive form line for a race like the kentucky derby but uh, we said it as they crossed the wire sean last year's remsen looked like it was good form looked like a race that might have kentucky derby implications and as we sit here now just a couple weeks before this year's kentucky derby i feel that way more than ever that we've got that for me, two of the three leading contenders coming out of that race in Mo Donegal and Zandon. Why don't we start with them? I'm curious to get your thoughts about each one from a pedigree point of view. Is one potentially more suited than the other to get the 10 furlongs, the full mile and a quarter distance of the Kentucky Derby? Um, actually, I think they're probably both equally suited. Uh, when you look at both of their pedigrees, and certainly um you go back to the rims and it's, it's been a great producer of high level horses it doesn't always produce the derby winner but when you go through and, and see the horses that compete there and either win or, or finish in the top three they usually go on to be pretty darn good horses so 
Um, certainly this year looks like an even better renewal of the Remsen with Mo Donegal and Zanon both leaving there to, to be productive um, in their prep races leading up to both the Wood victory, um, which was the fastest since Bellamy Road and that devastating performance and, and was only a couple ticks off the actual track record there set by, I believe it was Reva Ridge, who's a derby winner. Um, and then Zandon, you know, the Remsen was his second lifetime start and he went from a uh, six furlong sprint to a mile and eighth race um, and just got beat a dirty nose, came back. And, and really, when you watched his race there um, at uh, in the Risen Star, which that race itself has become a pretty uh, important race and key race looking at the derby picture. Um you know, he missed the break completely. I love the education that I believe it was Jose Ortiz on him that day, kind of tucked him in, didn't rush him up, ate some dirt. And then when you see him about the three-eighth pole, make that devastating move, the same turn of foot he makes in the bluegrass. But, you know, just um, the start cost him so much. And, uh, you know, Epicenter certainly um, showed what he was capable of that day as well. So uh, he came and then he, he flattered that form. Um in the in the bluegrass stakes with that devastating performance um so you look at his top side upstart <clears throat> he's by flatter um which we see flatter kind of sprinkled in several places on on the derby trail being tape is also out of a flatter mare we'll get to him down the road but uh you know that's that apnd line so certainly that gives you um the hope and you also see that in the bottom side of mo Donegal being out of a pulpit mare so Slew, uh, Triple Crown winner, APND, Belmont Stakes winner, all that on the bottom side gives that great uh, benefit for stamina for Mo Donegal on the top side there for Zandon. You had an Indian Charlie on the bottom side of, uh, of Zandon, as well as the Creative Cause uh, mayor that he's out of. Creative Cause was, uh, I believe, Santa Anita Derby winner and, and went on to uh, run fourth, I think it was, in the Derby, was a leading contender. Indian Charlie went off favored in the Derby. I believe he hit the board himself, so... You know, upstart, flatter, and then you got creative cause and Indian Charlie on the bottom side, immediate uh, broodmare sires. That horse should want every bit of the mile and a quarter, as well as the, uh, you know, Uncle Mo. He was he was very good at a mile and eighth. He, you know, probably in different situations, different uh, formats. If he had run another year, probably a mile and a quarter would have been well in his grasp. We've seen his horses and offspring get it. Yeah. Um, and then you add in the pulpit on the bottom side. So uh, both those horses... You know, being able to go to mile and eight at that time as a two-year-old, already coming back uh, and and putting themselves directly, you know, in the top five, definitely of the, of the derby picture. They, they've they got plenty of stamina to get the mile and a quarter. It's a great point. When you see horses get the mile and an eighth as early as they did in that Remsen in the two-year-old year, some might say, well, from there, I'm not that worried about, about pedigree. I think they'll get that extra distance. But I've seen enough over the years who can stretch to get the mile and an eighth and then that mile and a quarter ends up being a different animal. From a pedigree point of view, I definitely get it on Mo Donegal. You talked about Uncle Mo. He He's a horse that, you know, having had the chance to see him later when he had transitioned to his career as a stallion, I feel like once laying eyes upon him, I had no doubt that his babies were going to be able to do well at a mile and a quarter simply because of just how how much he continued to develop as a, as a as a horse as a stallion and just he had that 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 look that he was going to produce terrific routers. It's interesting on the other side of the pedigree and you make a good point about upstart, but I until we did the sort of pre-production call for the show I was sort of sleeping on the fact that on the stats, when I was looking at Upstart, one of the things you look at for sires to get a sense of how far their progeny want to go is the stat average winning distance. And the average winning distance for the Upstart babies, definitely on the lower side. But as you pointed out to me, as a second year sire, he just hasn't had that many opportunities to go long. And when you're looking at a first year sire, in many instances, they're going to be tilted their book of mares is going to be tilted towards sprintier more precocious ones because you got to get the sire off to a good start with winners and that might artificially deflate the average winning distance when you look at the actual bloodline farther should be just fine for this horse and upstart himself has certainly proved that by having a leading contender for both the kentucky derby and the kentucky oaks this year in kathleen o as, as you're the real expert on this stuff but is what i'm saying makes sense to you 100% and, and you know Uncle Mo's a more proven horse he even has a derby winner obviously through Nyquist um, so he has a sample size that helps support that they can get the distance whereas Upstart 
only his oldest crop are just now four. Um, most of your maiden special weight races and maiden races are usually around one turn. So, you know, you do have the two turn options, but a lot of times, you know, especially two year old races until they become older horses, just as his crops are now, you don't have the opportunities to run a further distance. So, um, now that his horses are a little bit older, they're, they're getting into more of, a, a program and, and being able to, to stretch out and get into the stakes races and, and perform at these levels, you're going to start to probably see. Uh, it skew a little bit more towards, you know, the mile uh, kind of average distance where you see a lot of, you know, your substantial horses that get good horses that can go around a ground. They're, they're usually somewhere in the seven furlong to a mile average winning distance. And that's just because your most of your maidens are, are short. Right. And, and it makes sense from just a business point of view, why in that first crop, those first couple of crops, you're going to be leaning towards horses that you think can get to the races and win and prove your sire things. It's, it's, it's not an easy game. You don't have unlimited time when you're trying to prove a stallion in your business. No, it's uh, you want to see him come out of the gate quick. Uh, you know, for example, a horse like we have this year, Tappert, he won the Belmont stakes as a three-year-old, but you have to remind people he's out of a grade one winning two-year-old and he was two for three himself as a, as a two-year-old. So, you know, you want the horses that show up early, that are precocious, that make the races, that can lay down the foundation, but then can, can, can continue to carry on that progression uh, and maturity to, to get around the two turns. But you have to have that foundation to be able to get to the Derby and, and these route races, the Whitney, whatever it may be, those prestigious two turn races. Let's talk about another runner. You mentioned the six furlong to nine furlong stretch out. We got another runner who did that last time, who's going to be appearing in this year's Derby, Taba, a horse who uh, does not have what we would traditionally call foundation, that's for sure, but really intriguing pedigree on this runner. And in terms of talent, he's already shown that the sky's the limit. You know, we've talked in, in form and figure terms, could it be too much too soon? But just looking at the bloodline, leaving aside anything else, and looking at the bloodline, Sean, what do you think of uh, Taba's chances to do well in a race like the Kentucky Derby? Yeah, you know, um, Gunrunner certainly was was a high-level three-year-old running third in the Derby, uh, competed in all the classic races and, and all the big three-year-old races, and obviously went on to be a champion older horse. Uh, we'd already mentioned that he's out of a flatter mare. That's uh, a classic distance, you know, kind of uh, attribute. So... This horse already going, you know, really doing something amazing, having already run two six figure um, buyer speed figures, which looking at the Derby over the last about 15 years or so, you know, the, the average buyer winning figures, maybe a 101, 102. So he's already kind of run two races that if he runs those races could win the Derby. Now, a five horse field with with a good pace scenario and, and, and horses to run at um, versus a 20 horse field is going to be a whole different animal for this horse, but he looked composed. He looked like he's handled everything so far. Um, but, but the foundation isn't there. Now the, the trainer that trained him leading up to uh, his, his first and, and second start. And, and now the trainer that has them certainly are, um, they understand how to get a horse ready for, for this time of year. So the foundation's there, uh, you know, the Baffert barn certainly puts the foundation into him early on in, in their breezes. So, you know, for what he may lack in um, in in the race, you know, foundation, he certainly has it uh, in the morning foundation and the horses he's been working against. But uh, it's it's going to be something, you know, justify ask to to come and win the first Saturday in May. But, uh, you know, records and, and jinxes are there to be broken. Let's talk about the horse that's going to probably be the favorite epicenter who's really impressed folks throughout the prep season, showed that new dimension last time. The sire who got off to an incredibly quick start in not this time and out of a candy ride mare. What do you think about Epicenter for a mile and a quarter? And what do you think of this horse in general in terms of his chances to justify favoritism? Um, I mean, I certainly can't argue with anyone who says this is the Derby winner. Um, I've loved his races so far. Um, one thing he has going for him is he has that one extra race as a three-year-old, you know, he's going to have three races as a, as a, as a three-year-old coming into the Derby versus kind of the typical format now where you have two races and you want the third being third off the layoff being the Derby, uh, candy ride, you know, the reason John Secura went and got candy ride to be a stallion at Hillendale when he started was because of his specific classic performance against Medaglia Doro. 
Um, I think it was, it may still be the record there. So that the candy ride has been a great influence um, for, for stamina. Not this time is by Giants Causeway, who certainly they can get a route of ground. Um, that Edward. horse, unfortunately, we didn't get to see him run as a three-year-old, but was just an unbelievably talented two-year-old. His Iroquois race, still one of the best races we've seen in the last 10 years, just a dominating performance. And go look back at, you know, the classic empire, not this time, Breeders' Cup Juvenile race, and what those two have become as far as sires and and race record, classic empire going on to, to do what he did as a three-year-old. So um, not this time, no surprise that he's an outstanding sire, has the talent out of a great broodmare. Um, so again, this horse, you know, and I think I love that the fact that, uh, you know, the, the Derby trail has been bounced around races changed different times. The Louisiana Derby has always been there at that time, but I love that it's now a mile three sixteen. So I think it makes it more, um, you know, more it, it that race is going to come into play a little bit more because of that distance. They, now that you still get the same time frame into the Derby, but you had to run that extra 16th of a mile. So it's a little bit of tightener. I've always thought going to the Derby, you have to be very fit. Uh, that's why I thought the Arkansas Derby was so good because you're three weeks out, go a mile and eighth and you get your, you're only three weeks out from the Derby. So that fitness is right there. Um, you don't have to breathe as much. You kind of maintain it. So I do think going that extra 16th of a mile is going to make the Louisiana Derby an even more relevant race going forward on the Derby trail. Um, Epicenter's done nothing wrong. He's, he can show that he's versatile. He can sit behind horses. He can go gate to wire. Uh, that does look like there may be a decent amount of speed in the Derby. But, uh, you know, whenever we say there's a lot of speed, then there ends up be, being none. So, to me, uh, Steve Asmus still can't believe that he hasn't won a Derby with everything he has won. Uh, we probably, Gunrunner may, may have been his best opportunity coming into any Derby. Certainly this horse, I can't think of another horse who uh, Asmussen's ever gone in that's as loaded and has the ability this horse has already proven it going in the derby. So uh, this could certainly get him off, off the duck there for the derby. And uh, you know, this, this is the type of horse you never know. He reels off the derby and, and, you know, Asmussen's wheeled back and, and won the Preakness, you know, off two weeks rest with Rachel Alexandra and, and Curlin. So you never know what, what might set up for, uh, for the Belmont down the road. If, if, if Epicenter can, uh, can pull off the derby. I, I use that type of horse that you could be talking about that first Saturday in June. You are, you are reminding me second Saturday this year with the weird, oh, calendar, sorry. The weird calendar, but no, but I get what you're saying. And you're reminding me a little bit of a, of a baseball player and you don't want to, you don't want to say the word no hitter uh, to the guy who's throwing the no hitter. It's almost like you don't want to jinx epicenter who you really think is a legit uh, triple crown contender, which I think is the, the, some bold, some bold words from you, a lot to unpack in what you said. I th think that's a great point about the Arkansas Derby. Makes you wonder they had moved it this year five weeks out if they might reconsider that decision. It seemed a little hasty to me when they moved it in the first place off of like basically one semi down year. I, I personally, I think it'd be interesting. I mean, hey, from a form analyst point of view, it's kind of great having all the major preps done four weeks out. But uh, the idea for that fitness reason of of moving it back to its old location. I mean, Hey, I, I get it. If they, if that is what they were to decide to do. And you made a great point about fairgrounds. I was just doing a little stats digging about all kinds of derby minutia. And I noticed that the Louisiana prep series, specifically Louisiana Derby had was on a negative streak of 21 years in a row before last year, 21 years in a row without uh, sending out a derby winner. And then last year at the longer distance, now granted the horse didn't really show his form in the Louisiana Derby, but Mandaloon breaks the streak, uh, assuming you go with the, the eventual winner of the Derby. But it's just interesting that already one year of going the mile and three sixteenths does seem to help. So the yeah. very small sample size, but there, I think there is, a, you know, at least a modicum of evidence that that mile and three sixteenths could make that a more relevant prep and maybe makes epicenter all the more, all the more of a threat. I mean, I wasn't planning on holding your feet to the fire this early in the show, but I think I'm going to do it from the glowing way you spoke of Epicenter. I mean, sitting here right now, is he your pick for this year's race? I won't say he's my pick. Um, I've always been a big Zandon fan. Um, but I, I do like, you know, I do like the way Epicenter runs in comparison to Zandon. So if I had to pick one because based on the type of trip I think they're going to get, I think Epicenter, I think Epicenter may get first run on everybody. You know, um, he just, the versatility gives you so many options. Obviously it comes down to the, 
the post position draw and everything, but I don't want to jinx him, but he breaks, you know, he does everything right. And, and, and from being around the Derby and the Derby trail for a while now, and, you know, you can't have any hiccups. It doesn't matter you can't, every day has to be a good day. And it just seems like this horse to this point has not missed a beat. And that's usually, those are the horses that either win the Derby or right there. You make such a good point, and I've heard you make that observation before. I've heard other horsemen make that observation before about how you can't really have a bad day in your three-year-old year. There's a leading contender for this race who's had a few bad days in uh, in in White Abario, and and when I say bad days, I just mean uh, talking to Safi Joseph. He was under prepped for his penultimate race. That run was a big surprise, and then even in the run-up to his last win, he had missed a day with a fever. Despite these things. White Abario um, feels like a horse who uh, has to be among the leading contenders, just looking at form and figures for this race. Let's talk about his pedigree, because this is a bloodline not everybody watching is necessarily going to be familiar with. Give me your overall thoughts on on White Abario, this lovely gray, and uh, and let us know what you think about how far he really wants to run. Well, I, I tell you, going under the wire uh... – in the Florida Derby, he looked like he uh, he wasn't uh, at his limit. So, you know, being by race day, who's a son of Tappet, uh, that's some influence. Certainly into mischief, uh, mares, even now that he's, you know, in his teens and just now coming into where his mares are in production, uh, they're a great influence. Um, so, you know, in the mischief, obviously he's had a Derby winner. Um, so I think that the distance as far as he's concerned is, is doable. Maybe, you know, a little bit more of a question mark than some of the others. Um, but I, would, I wouldn't say that he won't get it. Uh, he's done nothing wrong. I think this is a horse that's kind of almost flying under the radar a, a little bit um, and, and probably will get a little bit of an inflated price come the first Saturday in May and can definitely see this ho- horse hitting the board. Would he be my pick or even what, my top three picks? Probably not at this point, but he certainly uh, – I'll be using them in, in all exotics. Um, I do think the Florida Derby is, is of, you know, some of the key races. I do think the Florida Derby is a, is a race that always comes into play generally. And I do think this is a decent group of top two finishers in there. Um, Charge it is a horse who's short on, on race experience, just like some of the others, but uh, his pedigree screams, uh, Derby winner, you know, he's, he's by Tappet, who's still, that's the one thing he's missing on his resume is, uh, is a Derby winner, but he, you know, just got his fourth Belmont stakes winner last year. You have the bottom side Indian Charlie mayor, who is uh, out of the, you know, one of the greatest brood mares we've seen of all modern time, take charge lady who's produced, will take charge, take charge Indy. You know, these horses are classic horses, Omaha beach, all from that family, you know, take charge Brandy. These, these are the highest level uh, bloodstock that you have. Mandy Pope, I mean, doesn't it just seem like this is the kind of horse that's going to show up and win her the Derby, a homebred? A um, lot, of, lot of maturity, a lot of greenness he, that still needs to, you know, he almost needs to like double what he did in the Florida Derby to, to be able to beat uh, those other horses we've kind of discussed based on foundation and, and race. But if he can put it all together, and uh, he's certainly in the right barn to get that done. So he's a horse who definitely need to be watching during the, um, you know, training leading up to the Derby. If he comes in just training like a monster and glowing, he's going to run a big one. I think that's he's my pick of the two. And I know that everybody's kind of on that. that and I don't want to disrespect White Barrio because I am going to use him in all my exotics. But, but Charger to me is, is that horse that uh, – could really jump up and make a big splash of all the other horses that that are a little light on um, foundation. Am I correct in saying if you'd been in a coma for the last three months and I put uh, past performances in front of you, but they didn't have the horses races, they just showed you the pedigrees that charge it would be the one that most people in the breeding industry would pick out as the derby winner just looking at pedigree alone or is that hyper- hyperbole? I mean, it's it's as sexy it's as sexy as as, as it gets. I mean, it is um, the depth, the quality, you know, broodmare of the year. Um, it is you know, champion sire. You know, it is everything you want in a pedigree. Let's talk about some other pedigrees that might not be as instantly 
um, identifiable as suited to a test like the Kentucky Derby. Looking here at uh, Tiz the Bomb, Kenny McPeak's extremely talented three-year-old. There was some talk about them maybe looking to, to go back to turf or go to turf with this runner. Uh, has shown success on the on the synthetic. Um, hit it a bomb. Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf winner. Obviously, folks are going to recognize Tiz now in the pedigree. This is one just from a horse-playing standpoint. I'm probably going to have to let him prove it to me, but it's not like I'd fall over or anything. We we have seen horses make the adjustment to uh, – to, to the dirt in the Derby in the past. What do you think of uh, of Tiz the Bomb and, and his pedigree for this test? Do you see anything in there that gives you optimism? I mean, you, you kind of hit upon it. The Tiz now uh, hit it a bomb is a war front that won the juvenile turf, long odds. Um, this horse, you know, I, he ran the jockey club, I believe, on dirt as a two-year-old. Um didn't really jump up that this was going to be something that he wanted to do down the future. They've kind of, you know, game planned him to take a turf route uh, for the year, certainly winning the race, getting the Derby points. Uh, it's hard to pass up the Derby, but it, this just feels like, um, you know, we'll run the Derby and then we'll see him back on the turf. Right. We'll, we'll see how it all uh, how it all ends up shaking out, but that does that does feel like uh, feels like the more the more likely route when it comes to tis the bomb and his chances. I wanted to ask you about another pedigree that I think uh, people are not going to be too familiar with here in uh, Crown Pride, the Japanese runner who this horse I've heard so much interesting speculation about. At some point, we'll get to doing a write up or talking about it in depth about what kind of speed figure Crown Pride earned in that run in Dubai. This is a horse going out uh, for, for a country that's just shown dominance all over the world, known much more with their young horses for, for stamina, running horses going very going much farther, much earlier than we do, which makes you wonder in a truly run, if we ever see a truly run Kentucky Derby again, if that might... Uh, mean this is the only horse uh, really kicking in uh, towards the end i'm just curious if you have any thoughts about crown pride if you see anything from a pedigree point of view that, that gives him a chance to be in the mix well look i mean it's it's littered with uh sunday silence and and and, and we know his impact on the derby trail when he was in america and the breeders cup classic so um <clears throat> i give total respect to to all japanese horses they do breed for stamina um so like you said, I mean, this could be the year. Is this is this where you know you get four or five horses that all kind of tangle up? If early voting shows up, you know, um, if Epicenter is up there, if White Barrio is kind of pushing it, you know, there's there's a couple different horses. You know, I, what kind of trip is Messier going to get? Is he going to be a horse that that goes out because you know he can have that early early speed as well? So, I mean, at some point they're probably going to pull it off. And it won't surprise us, but um, it's it's hard it's hard for me to to give this much. I'd I, I'd love to see one come over and, and kind of win a, a prep race here on the Derby Trail, um, and maybe take the U.S. route to get to the Derby, just to have a little bit more confidence in knowing knowing it. But uh, as far as the UAE Derby is concerned, um, I don't think we really saw any of America's you know top or top horses show up there, so. As far as what he beat in that race, it's it's pretty hard to um, to think that that it's it's on level with what he's going to run against in the Derby. It didn't look like good form, and it's an exceptionally exceptionally different race to make a figure for. So <laughs> there's a case to be made, but I'm I'm expecting uh, I'm ex I'm probably going to let. Uh, let them let the Japanese prove it to me that they're capable of getting a, a Kentucky Derby winner. Though, if the horse is 30 to one, I, there will probably be some combinations where you would say, you know what, why not looking at the, looking at the whole field in certain exotic bets. So we'll, we'll see what happens with that one. We're not going to run down the whole probable field here, Sean. So I'll throw it open to you for a couple horses. You might want to talk about who you think are either interesting from a, from a pedigree point of view or that you doubt from a pedigree point of view, or just that you're interested in, in general for us to chat about in the next few minutes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we've covered the majority of them. Um, certainly cyber knife is a horse that 
He's also a son of, of Gunrunner. I am most excited about early voting. He's a horse that I think has um, quite a bit of upside as well. Both certainly bred to get the distance, both by Gunrunner. Um, you know, you saw Cyberknife there is out of a flower alley uh, mare. He was the Travers winner. Uh, he was maybe the favorite in the Derby or top two or three choices when he when he ran in the Derby. Same thing here, uh, early voting by Gunrunner, but out of uh, a Tisnow mare, you know, two-time Breeders Cup Classic winner. Um, I think this horse has a ton of talent. He hasn't run many races. You know, we were discussing, I know there's some whispers, does he go to the Derby? Does he wait for the Preakness? Um, so it'll be very interesting to see how um, and, and where this horse shows up uh, because – even if he can set just a little bit different pace and if he doesn't have to be on the lead and in the Derby maybe sits off a horse or two, I think that makes him, you know, just like Epicenter, I think they're going to be forwardly placed, can sit off a horse if need be and can get first run. And, uh, you know, you go and you look at who wins, you got to be, I think, top either three or top four at the quarter pole in the Derby or you're not winning it, which that gives me hesitation on Mo Donegal, Zandon and um, Smile Happy. Those, those are the three that I think are, you know, legitimate horses to win it. But I'm concerned that their trip isn't favorable for the Derby. Um, and again, you know, smile happy, have a pleasant tap. That's going to give you all the uh, stamina in the world. Run happy's by Super Saver, who was uh, a der Derby winning winner himself. He's been excellent around uh, two turns, smile happy. He shows up every time. I, I thought his bluegrass was an excellent race and he laid a little bit closer. You know, if he wasn't four or five wide around the first turn, um, he might've had a little bit more of a, a kick turning for home um, and made it a little bit closer than Zandon. You know, he had a very interesting trip. I love that he showed he was a little bit closer, which is what I'm going to want to see in the Derby, but you can't be wide on both turns. Um, so, so that's kind of one of those maybe, his trip was a little bit disadvantageous to him in that race with a little bit better trip in the Derby. Uh, I think he's got every shot to be right there himself. You talked about the need to be in the mix at the quarter pole. I'll tell you what, when you look at the last seven derbies run, basically since the advent of the points system, you can even make more definitive statements about how close you need to be and at what stage and that's not noise there's signal in that you got to remember before and maybe some people watching the video don't know this but before the point system they went on a graded stakes earnings basis and it didn't matter if those graded stakes came in sprints or what we call routes races a mile and longer and that led to a lot of people just taking shots with their sprinters and uh, wanting to hear their names called at some point during the during the kentucky derby and they were successful in that goal there's a really cool metric um it's a little arcane, but I, you know, we are, we're a sophisticated audience. We can handle it. It's called BL12. And basically what that means is beaten lengths at the first and second call. So for example, uh, a zero BL12 would mean, or BL12 would mean a horse who led from wire to wire, was in front at every call uh, and a big number, you know, 10 or higher, that's going to be a, a closer. That means a horse that was, you know, on average five lengths back at the first and second call of the race, the calls happening every uh, quarter mile or so. But so you look at the BL12s before the point system came in, going back, you know, Orb and before, uh, you know, 29, 12, 11, 12, 37. You can probably guess uh, which horse that was. That was our man, Mind That Bird. Um, four, 38. Seven and a half, 29. That was Giacomo. The point is, closers were pretty dominant during that period. Then the race changes. It's the point system. And all of a sudden, you have 3.5, 3.0, 4.5, 2.0, 1.0. And in terms of first past the post, Sean, you know what it is for the last three years zero, zero, zero. Three horses, three years in a row where a horse led at every point of call of the Kentucky Derby which does make it hard for me who wants to sit here and tell you about how uh, Zanadon, Zandon and Mo Donegal are going to run one too. But the reality is also that, you know, jockeys and their agents and the trainers and everybody associated with the horse handicaps too. And I, I'm, I'm wondering if this is maybe the year where this trend becomes evident to everybody. And we see some horses being a little bit more aggressively ridden. Now, obviously we'll know a lot more, 
about who all's going to turn up in a few weeks time and the post positions are going to affect it too. But, but I, for one, as a big fan of those horses, I'm hoping this is the year we can see more of an of injection of pace in the Derby. And I'm hoping a runner like um, early voting does decide to go um, w- with that in mind. I mean, do you think we can get back to the days where we see a big closer uh, making a run in a race like the Kentucky Derby, or is, is that just from days gone by? We'll, we'll see it again. There, there will be a time, you know, it won't be the norm as long as it stays this way. I, you know, you're going to speed, speed wins, wins races, but, but at some point you're going to have a crazy scenario and, and, and something from mid pack or further back is, is, is going to come, come and, and, and get them. But um, you know, exaggerator, I think was second there to Nyquist. And, and so, you know, there, it will happen, you know, looking at Lee, you know, that that's where, you know, you got to find that those couple horses, um, that are going to come up and pass some of those tired horses that don't quite want a mile and a quarter, and uh, and that's where you get the bombs. You know they may not win, but but the closers will fill. You know second through through fourth fourth possibly. So it's not one that you can toss them out completely, but definitely for winning the race, um, they're up against it. One horse I think can provide an injection of of much needed pace from my point of view is Zozos, the Brad Cox runner, last seen running second to epicenter in that uh, in that Louisiana Derby. I watched the tape of that race. I can't tell you many reasons why Zozos is supposed to finish ahead of epicenter going forward. And I'm reminded, looking at Zozos, of a conversation I had with the Brad Cox on one of the shows in the last couple of years where he said at the sale, they're looking for horses that want to go a mile, maybe a mile and a 16th. And he figures on training, he can get them to go the extra distance. Well, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, but I look at Zozos's pedigree being by Munnings out of the, the, uh, the forestry damn Papa's forest. And I see one that's maybe bred to get seven furlongs and he's trying that trick with now, obviously ran a nice figure in a big race in the Louisiana Derby and you go broke basically um, fading Brad Cox in, in modern horse racing. But, but this is a horse I'm hoping they just, they go out there and they go as far as they can, as, 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 as fast as they can and, and help set the race up. But I'm not, I'm not imagining a world where we see him in the exacta at the end. Am I underselling Zozos? No, I'm glad you actually brought him up because that's the horse that, you know, when you, when you think about pace scenario, I'm thinking he is going to be, the speed possibly. Um, and he is a horse that kind of, of all the years that we've had over the past decade or whatever, since the point system, he is the one horse that almost fits the profile of a sprinter esque type horse. Now um, I agree with you. I don't see him being in top three or four unless he just gets a very soft pace up front. Um, but he's a very talented horse. This is a horse that, you know, like a hard spun type horse that you know, when, when they do shorten up maybe and or to a one turn mile, mile 16th, you know, seven furlongs, he's going to be a horse to be reckoned with. Now, um, we'll see if he does show up to the Derby. Um, you know, I, I haven't heard any reason why he won't, but um, he is he is the one horse I think is could ensure that kind of very honest pace up front. Another one who will be in the mix for um, early leader, just looking at pace figures and a really fun pedigree to talk about in its own right is uh, is the runner Messier. And I know, you know, bringing a hockey guy in, you knew I wasn't going to let you get out of here without talking about Messier at some point. I'm hoping to see him handled very aggressively, thinking his best shot might be to prove the best speed uh, unless Zozo's heads out there on a mission. I'm curious to get your comments on him. On one hand, hard to see him reversing form with Taba, given Taba was able to run him down, even though Messier probably had the better trip um, last time out. But this also feels like a horse who you go back and you look and it has a lot of things that just sort of click. The boxes get checked. Good speed. Uh, has two-year-old stakes. Good two-year-old stakes form. A little bit of an old school potential value angle on Messier if the price just gets wild. What do you think of him? Yeah, I mean, certainly this horse is bred to get the distance. I I feel the same as you. I almost want to see this horse put on the lead and uh, and see him just come and catch me if you can. Um, you know, I feel like in his race against Forbidden King, when Forbidden King was a horse I thought had no business going to mile and eighth, um, and Messier kind of sat there and pressured him, and, and you know. I'd like, I, I do, I just don't know. He's kind of like a grinder type horse. I don't see a, a turn of foot 
in, in him in his last couple of races. Um, for me, I, I wonder if he has that real deep down desire to win. Uh, he's, he's lost a couple battles. Um, but he's a horse that if he puts it on the front end, like a Medina spirit and you get, and you get, get pretty proud of yourself, might just hold on. Cause he will get the mile and a quarter and depending on the fractions, you know, and, and, you know, the training he's received and, and his foundation, um, I can't rule him out. I actually think you might get a decent price on the horse. Um, and I do think a lot of the money is going to go to towards Taba from that San Anita Derby. I just don't have that same, you know, it's almost kind of like Medina spirit last year. Like you kind of talk about them, but then you move on to some other horses. Um, so, you know, we, we know how that turned out last year. <laughs> it did make me wonder. I was expecting when we talked to Michelle, Yu on the Derby draft show, who was a big Medina spirit fan. I was, I was expecting a similar case to be made for, for, for Messier. She didn't want to make it. Um, she's all about, uh, she's all about cyber knife. She has a, a much more optimistic view of the Arkansas Derby form than, than I do, but we'll, we'll get to talking about that on other shows, but this is a horse I'm, I'm keeping on my radar for the deepest, uh, for the deepest potential tickets, especially if he, if he ends up being the price I think he's going to be. And if the pace scenario ends up being what I think it's going to be, he's one that would probably be, they'd probably be pretty happy if early voting decides not to go, but you know, we'll have a lot more time to get into pace angles and things like that as we get closer to the first Saturday in May. We've run through a good number of these. Obviously, there's a bunch more. I'll just throw you one more softball open ender, Sean, if you have any final thoughts or you want to pull up another pedigree to look at on any of these contenders or, or just anything you want to say about this year's uh, Derby or the, the kickoff of the our Baby Talk season. Well, super excited for the uh, Baby Talk. A lot of uh, very exciting um Freshman sires this year, you know, both the Orioles got off to a big start. We've got Taprit, um, a lot of exciting first-year horses, Middleson, Justify. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how, how their two-year-olds come out, um, how we get going kind of coming up Saratoga, and, and, and you get to see a little bit more. So so excited about that. And, uh, you know, not to forget about the Elks, but uh, I think we got a pretty exciting uh, four or five fillies are going to be showing up there. And, you know, Upstart was in the talk with with Zandon and, and Kathleen O. I mean, she certainly looks like like a top notch filly. You know, Adair Manor is one that I had high hopes for. I didn't love her last race, but she certainly uh, looks like a con contender. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, until you beat the champ, she's still the champ. And uh, she hasn't done anything wrong in her five starts. And I think that probably that last race, we probably don't give enough credit to her and, and, and winning that victory. I thought Hidden Connection ran a huge race. Um but, you know, to ha not have run since uh, the Breeders' Cup and, and come and, and win the Fairgrounds Oaks, which is one of the best producers of Oaks winners over, uh, you know, the last 15, 20 years. So um, pretty excited for uh, for the Oaks as well as the Derby. I, I think they're going to be two very exciting races. Um, and spring is here. Echo Zulu hasn't gone the nine furlong distance yet, but it feels like based on everything she's done and, and the ease of victory in the juvenile Phillies specifically, there's not a whole lot of reason to deny her. And another excuse to talk about the, the incredible things that Gunrunner has done so far. Yeah. I mean, I wish she was standing at my farm. I can tell you that much. So it makes <laughs> life a little bit easier, but uh, yeah. look, he's got, he's got a Royal pedigree, you know, like charge it, right. He's got a Royal pedigree. Um, he was a high talented horse that ran, ran from two to four and, um, was always in the big dances. So, uh, no surprise that, uh, he showed up, uh, doing what he did, but it's, it's, it's another level. This is, this is the t type of stallion that, you know, is a generational, uh, changer. So pretty exciting for the entire industry. I'm, I agree. And it's a fun, it's definitely a fun Oaks in terms of pedigree as well. We've talked about several of the of the angles already, but uh, as long as we're doing that, we have another minute left, Sean. We, let's have a word on Nest, who's got this great pedigree by Curlin out of Marion Ravenwood by AP Indy. Uh, not a bad cross. Not a bad cross. Uh, shout out to Ashview Farm. They've got a big uh, Oaks Derby weekend, so if you're lucky enough to hang out with them, they could have a, a big one. They, they bred Mo Donegal, and they also bread nest so uh always rooting for the listers great great people um been a long time supporter of the industry but uh she looked like an absolute monster in that race and uh 
boy, it's going to be hard to beat her. She might, she, she might just put on a performance that we haven't seen since, you know, who knows, like a rags and riches type kind of, you know, type Philly. She, she looks pretty special. I'll tell you what, she's going to have, it's a, there's not going to be any, well, who did she beat if she does the, one of those performances, given what we've seen from, you know, the others we've mentioned, we haven't actually given a call the secret oath yet, but certainly deserves a mention as well as part of that salty group. Yeah. I wasn't sure how fast she was. And then last time just imperious in victory and the clock loved the race too. So yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a fun weekend. We're going to have you back on the show soon, Sean, but we wanted to get the season kicked off and sort of wrap up with a bunch of the runners like uh, Echo Zulu we talked about last year and look forward a bit to this year as well. And, of course, get the update of everything going on out at Gainesway. Thank you for your time today, brother. We'll be talking soon. Thanks, Pete. Always enjoy it. Before we get out of here today, bringing in a, a guest who we've had on many, many times to give us updates about all of the goings on at the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, the charity we've been very, very uh, happy to support ever since we went solo as a podcast. We call her the first lady of the of the Money Players podcast. Kim Weir, how are things and where are you? I am happily in Louisville, Kentucky, um, at a magical place called Paris Town on this beautiful Monday. And glad to be with you, Pete. Thanks for having me. Well, it's glad that, I'm glad you mentioned Louisville because that's a perfect segue to the first topic of conversation. Folks on the network were hearing for a couple of weeks about this auction we were doing fully for the benefit of the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. We had all the hosts tweeting about it. People really got behind this idea and, and we got ourselves a result, didn't we? We sure did. Amazing thanks to you, Pete, and the whole In the Money family for spreading the word. But we did indeed, thanks to our very good friends at Churchill Downs Incorporated, we were given a box of seats, uh, 300 level at the Derby. Auction went well, and we had a winner, and it's a wonderful, wonderful woman who has let me share her name. Her name is Carrie Brogdon, um, big part of the racing industry herself, um, and she's bringing her hubby and her kids, and they are going to have a great day at the races, all to benefit the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. So thanks all around to you, Pete, to Churchill Downs, to Carrie and her family. The horses say thank you, and I think a lot of fun will be had. Hopefully I'll get a chance to go up and say hi, carry a name, be very familiar. You know, this is our baby talk hybrid. So industry people are going to know, uh, are going to know this name very oh. well, active, uh, super active at the, at the sales and, and so happy to have that support and knowing that it's going to such a great cause. Now for other folks that want to help, you know, of course we have our donation link, trfinc.org slash players, but we're always adding little things to it, trying to come out this from a slightly different angle and find ways to help you, you and Kim and the TRF and the Second Chances program and all the great work being done. But you got a cool new idea that I wanted you to share with people on the show today. Yes. Well, this is why I'm here at wonderful Paris town in Louisville is that we have an amazing partner. They must have been inspired by you, Pete. And their name is Stoneware and Company, which is just a super cool company that does all these beautiful um, ceramics and home goods. And they have a tradition of a commemor commemorative derby bottle that they purchase a, a large lot, 400 bottles, in fact, from Woodford Reserve. It's the special derby edition. So this year, the 148 derby edition with the beautiful Jamie Corum artwork on the label. And what they then do is they choose a charity. In this case, it's luckily the horses of the TRF. And they dedicate a the proceeds from the sale of this commemorative um, bottle to to us. And they did this last year um, and they've chosen to give us these proceeds again this year. So so the hook is that um, once these bottles are on pre-sale right now through Stoneware and Company um, for one hundred and twenty nine dollars and then the purchased bottles will be all signed by a very special duo. This year, it will be Doug O'Neill and Mario Gutierrez in celebration of the 10th anniversary of All Have Another's Derby. Um, so we're very grateful to Doug and to Mario for, for, for taking this on, signing 400 bottles of beautiful bourbon, which they will be signing during Derby Week. And uh, these are available right now. They're they they they're they're selling quickly. I think they're cl they're closing in on 200 of the 400 bottles have already been sold. Um, so we were here today with our friends at Stoneware and Company, um, just getting all the details pinned down for the bottle signing on Derby Week. So well, that's what we're here to promote. Love it. You can find them on the Stoneware and Co website. But you know what? Let's make it easy for them, Kim. Let's pop a link right up on our usual donation page as well. 
which is, of course, trfinc.org slash players. And while you're there, if you're a whiskey person, you know, we still have also for the benefit of TRF, both the, uh, I think there's a couple bottles of the In the Money whiskey from last year around. And then I think you still might have a hand, just a handful of the Animal Kingdom commemorative bottles. That's so. right. Because last year we started this partnership with um, celebrating Animal Kingdom's 10 year. And so, yeah, there probably are. I think that might have six more of those commemorative bottles from last year. Um, so that is definitely still an option. Uh, we are so grateful to Stoneware for choosing us to do this. Uh, we, we raised $25,000 from this bottle promotion last year. That's a lot of horses living happily. So thank you for helping me share it today, Pete. It's exciting. While I've got you, a couple other things I want to discuss. We talked a bunch on the show about not this past time I was in Lexington, but the time before that, uh, the ability to go to check out uh, Blackburn, um, a correctional facility and i understand you had some some news on that front because we had put out a call recently to let listeners know who are in the area that uh you know as a not open to everybody but as you know sort of vip guest of the show slash trf that a visit could be arranged and we've had some folks take us up on that huh? that's right i love your listeners are listening and then they take action these are two of my favorite qualities in a person so in fact following in your footsteps is our very good friend and friend of the show dave nichols who's also just like a superstar trf volunteer he's in town this coming weekend at keeneland for i think the big um no doubt for the right? contest no doubt for the contest with that yeah guy. So he's bringing some of his contest buddies. So a few of his friends of, uh, are following his lead. And I am taking the handicappers to the horses on Friday this week. And I'm so excited about it. So that is when we talk about putting those horses in the heart of the horse player, Pete. You, 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 you minted it and you've made the mold. And now we're just we're, we're following in your footsteps. Great. Give me way too much credit, my friend. But the, the <laughs> idea that uh, that he and, and Jorge will get to have that experience that I had. I mean, as I've said many times on these airwaves, it was a very moving experience and, and made me all the more committed to the work that you're doing over there. And it's something that folks should think about for future, uh, maybe getting a little late in the meet this year. But, you know, reach out. Kim is always uh, going to, if she can accommodate you, she will. And it's it's I think the more we spread the word about this, the better it off it's going to be for the TRF. Now, speaking of things that are good for the TRF that are connected to our listeners, you've got a little update where you folks remember we did the amazing we had an amazingly generous anonymous donor donate the Kentucky Derby memorabilia collection that went to auction last year. And the money was earmarked for certain specific projects. And just to let folks know that the, we follow up on these type of things, you, you had an update for us. I do. So I had been at Wallkill just a couple of weeks ago and I had seen this in process. But just this morning, my awesome colleague Chelsea said, hey, I've got a picture of the run-in shed. So two things were done at Wallkill, thanks to our friend who is a magical, amazing, anonymous donor. Um, one is that we are putting in a new run-in shed at Wallkill, which on these rainy days, it's actually rainy here in Louisville today, are very important. It gives our horses a place to be in out of the weather. Um, when we're putting a new one in at Wallkill, it's up, it's in, I have a picture. And the other really important project, which is the perfect thing because our, our donor said, I want you to do the thing that you've been wishing for that just isn't in the regular operating budget. And that's that's what we did. We're putting in a, um, automatic waterers at Wallkill, which are gravity um, run. They're not uh, they're not electric and they don't freeze, which otherwise uh, all the waterers freeze at Wallkill. So the ability to put those waterers in has been a huge gift and they're they're going in the ground now. So they, they, I will have pictures of both the run in shed and the waterers. And I want our wonderful donor and everyone who supported that auction and everyone who's inspired to know we turn that gift into real meaningful things for our horses. So thank you. Thank you to all. And thank you to that one special person in particular. Folks who want to get involved, you know, the easiest thing to do is to send a few bucks. We always say, especially if you have a score, if you do well based on something you hear on the shows, trfinc.org slash players. And Kim, what's this the best way for people who want to reach out to you? We have your Twitter up there, but I know that's that's really a company Twitter. Folks that want to contact you specifically, just through the TRF website, what would you yeah, say? Yeah, so it's it's really simple. It's Kim at trfinc.org. Our website is our is our email, and just Kim. I'm the only Kim here. Um, and so send me an email. Let me know what you're thinking. If you're in Ocala or if you're in Lexington in particular, I would love to arrange for you to meet some of our horses and see the magic that they're doing as we speak 
right now, thanks to fab fabulous donors like you, Pete, and all that you inspire. You give me way too much credit, but I am always happy to put <laughs> microphones in front of interesting people and let them talk and then harness the power of horse players, which is very much of a real thing. Kim, we'll have you back for another update soon. I'm sad our paths just missed each other in yeah. Kentucky this time around, but we'll uh, we'll get to hang soon up, up north. I can't wait. Thank you, Pete. Be well. Okay, that's going to do it for this edition of the show. We'll thank Kim Weir one more time. We will thank our man, Sean Tugel, one more time as well. Always good getting a chance to catch up with him. Producer Craig will thank him. Most of all, though, I want to thank all of you, the listeners and viewers, for making the show fun to do. Help us out. Like and subscribe where you get your podcasts or especially over on our YouTube channel, which is really building into something special around this time of the year. And if you can continue to support us in that regard, even if you're just listening on audio, hop over to YouTube and uh, like and subscribe. We would very much appreciate it. Our founding partners, you heard all about the TRF, also our friends at uh, Black Type Thoroughbreds. Main sponsor though uh, today for Baby Talk. So happy to be working once again with Gainsway and following that and the two-year-old season and the, the freshman sire standings and all the stuff we do. Going to be a little bit of a different schedule this year for Baby Talk, but we will be back and we'll give them the Baby Talk uh, close instead of the In the Money Players podcast close. They just have to change like one little phrase at the end. But I first will still let you know that our chief creative officer is Jonathan Kinchin. Our business manager is Drew Coatney. I'm Peter Thomas Fornatal. May the hammer drop your way. <laughs>